Hello and welcome. I'm Steve Clemens. I'm editor at large of The Hill. Thanks so much for joining us for our program today called The New Role of Telehealth, an in-depth discussion on improving patient care and the role of telemedicine in our healthcare system. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Neurocrin Biosciences, for making this event possible. The explosion of telehealth has been a lifesaver for many during the pandemic, allowing patients to check in with doctors regularly while avoiding crowded emergency rooms. But the digital divide and the inability to diagnose certain conditions remotely has also created challenges for both physicians and patients adjusting to a more virtual world. So where's the balance right? We've got to figure this out. As we assess the future of telehealth, how do we strike that right balance between virtual and in-person patient care? And how do we ensure the highest quality of care for every patient? We've got a fantastic lineup of speakers here today to answer these questions and much more. Before we get underway, a few housekeeping notes. You can tweet us at, at The Hill Events, using the hashtag, the hashtag, The Hill Telehealth. We're broadcasting live and we'll take your questions throughout the program. And if you experience any trouble with the live stream, please refresh the page and that will fix all the problems, or that's what they tell me. My first guest of the afternoon is Congressman Brad Schneider, who represents Illinois' 10th District. He's a member of the Ways and Means Health Subcommittee. Representative Schneider, it's great to see you. Look, I mean, I think that one of the things I'm fascinated by is, you know, I've been doing conversations on health for a long time and also the digital age that's coming. But the pandemic literally changed our lives so much where so much of our daily life experience, our work, our connections with family members, and our connections with the health profession have gone digitally. Where do you think we're getting it right? Where do you think we're getting it wrong in this new digital telehealth space? Well, Steve, first, it's good to be with you. Thank, thanks for having me on, on the program. And you're absolutely, absolutely right. We are seeing a dramatic shift in, in the way tele, uh, telephony is being used in general and, and telehealth in particular. Uh, the the pandemic uh, forced many medical practices, uh, many physicians and, and, and others to uh, rely on the ability to do, whether it's a Zoom call or whatever platform, uh, to, to meet with their patients, to, to engage in that care. Uh, the way I describe it is that uh, prior to the pandemic, there were a lot of people who were uh, anywhere on the spectrum from doubtful to skeptical to um, curious about telehealth. I think post-pandemic, we're all uh, very enthusiastic about its possibilities. But you're also right, we have to find the right balance. And it's it's not going to be static. Doctors will develop new approaches in taking care of their patients, to develop relationships. But uh, it will be a, a supplement, certainly, to what we're doing in healthcare. When you are interacting with your constituents and you're out in the field and, and talking to people, what are the some of the stories you're hearing you know, about about the, this kind of conversation. And, you know, when, I'm, I'm trying to sort of look at what the public policy side of this ought to look like, you know, because I do know on one hand, there's been a, you know, a lot of surprise at how um, amazing and empowering telehealth has been for some. And there's a little bit of worry that it may be wobbly depending on how uh, Medicare reimbursement goes down the road. But then I know a lot of other folks have ailments. They said, hey, you know, we, we don't want to get left behind in that next new brave world coming along. Right. So I, I, I've heard the, I, the full spectrum, as, as you touched on it, that people who have used telehealth, uh, both providers and patients, have very much appreciated the opportunity. Uh, what it means is the ability to, to see a doctor. Uh, if someone who lives in a, a remote location can get to that doctor uh, instantaneously without having to drive uh, an hour or longer for, for an appointment, it, it means a uh, cut down on wait times. It means uh, access to specialists. All of that is, is, is very positive. Uh, but I've also heard from the medical professionals. They're seeing many more patients. It, it's expanded their capacity and capabilities, but they want to make sure that they're being fairly reimbursed for the time they spend with their patients. Can you tell us a little bit more about broadband accessibility and what it's like in your district? I mean, it's some of the things that, that comes up so often in all of my conversations, both sides of the aisle, senators, House members. And I guess to tell you, as an American, you know, I, look, I live on the net, but I mean, I, I just find it one of the most staggeringly ridiculous elements of this country that we have so many people that can't connect. What's the story in your district? Yeah, you know, it's the same that we're seeing across the country. Broadband is the electricity of 100 years ago. We are, uh, it is the distinction of are you a part of the modern world or are you being held back? Uh, my district, which is the suburbs of Chicago, uh, northern suburbs, uh, certain areas have incredible access to high-speed internet, uh, as, as much bandwidth as, as they could possibly desire. Other places are, are lagging far behind. Uh, from uh, the, the first stories we started hearing when the schools went to remote is that uh, there were uh, areas where people had to go 
park their cars outside of public libraries or uh, other places. Uh, some school districts were, were renting school buses with hotspots to go into areas uh, to provide access to that educational um, uh, resource. But it's the same is true. If you can't get on for school, you're not getting on for your doctor. So we need to make sure that every community has access to, to broadband. That's why it was a part of the American Rescue Plan. It's a part of the infrastructure plan that hopefully will be passed soon uh, to continue to expand the, the broadband's reach so that in the same way we take for granted, wherever we go, we can flip a switch and turn on the lights, that we can uh, turn our, our devices and connect with our doctors, our teachers, or our family members. So there's a lot in that big reconciliation bill. And there's a lot in there about human infrastructure. As you just talked, you know, there may be everything from kind of expanding um, uh, Medicare to include dental benefits to whatever. Can I just ask you from your insights, because, you know, a lot of us have not read, you know, the kind of light item, you know, parts of what's in that bill. On the health side of this, what do you think is solid and secure um, in the legislation that's pending? What do you think could be on the chopping block? Yeah, so everything's uh, on the table right now being negotiated, but I think there are certain things that we need to make sure are part of uh, whatever package goes forward. Uh, broadband, as we discussed, is part of the infrastructure bill, uh, an expansion of broadband, making sure we're getting it to all of our community communities, whether those are urban or rural communities, that everyone can rely on that, that robust access uh, uh, to, uh, whether it's telemedicine or, or whatever form of telecommunications. Uh, but it's also expanding access to care. Uh, making sure that uh, everyone in this country can have health care as a right, not as a privilege. Uh, we have a, a, a number of, of bills that we'll invest in. Uh, you mentioned uh, expansion of Medicare. Um, there's talk of expanding it for uh, vision, dental, and, and uh, hearing. Uh, we'll see which of those uh, survive. I think there's going to be a lot of, of negotiations. But what are the basic things we need to be looking for? One is the basic, basic access to care, and, and that's why broadband and telemedicine is so important in that piece. Uh, we want to continue to provide uh, more physicians and, and, and healthcare professionals. We know that there are many places around the country that are suffering. I have legislation that would expand access um, to uh, uh, residencies so that more hospitals can, can educate the, the doctors for, for the future. Uh, as well, not a part of the reconciliation, but I'll be introducing a bill this week, bipartisan uh, legislation with Brad Westrop of Ohio. Uh, that will, in the same way last year, or in the last Congress, we introduced legislation for high deductible health plans uh, to guarantee everyone at least two visits to a primary care physician. Uh, this new, new bill would provide at least two telemedicine visits in every health uh, high deductible health plan. So at least everyone is getting that basic health care, building the relationship with the doctor, and the chance that they do need more, more significant care, they, they have a relationship already established. Look, today's topic is, is very interesting to me because, you know, part of it is to look at the reality that telehealth has expanded. There's another dimension, though. You know, what is the right equilibrium? You know, kind of tell people there. And it just makes me think about that, you know, I've talked to a lot of doctors. I know a lot of, you know, colleagues of yours that are doctors in the so-called doctor's caucus. And, you know, a lot of times people in the public don't understand the economic and financial stress that the medical profession itself is under. And I'm just wondering, you know, as efficiencies are created for both the patient, uh, for citizens, you know, and efficiencies created for the medical sector, that the, you know, the physician sector, there is this still this need of kind of in-person people out there. And I, you know, I know this is not your job, but I'm just wondering, do we have a brewing public policy problem about getting that balance right, that the medic, that the hospitals, the providers, the others out there, you know, may not have the same kind of economic foundation they may have had before telehealth became so expansive. Right. Well, I'll I'll shift the word, play with words a little bit, and call it a challenge more than a problem. It, mm -hmm. it is going to be a challenge. How do we find that right balance? Uh, I don't think telehealth is going to completely replace in-person medicine. Uh, for example, uh, a year and a half ago, uh, my son, I guess just over a year ago, my son had a bike accident and hurt his arm. Uh, the care he needed, the surgery, he, uh, you can't operate on a separated shoulder um, through telehealth. But the ongoing care, the, the rehabilitation, the checking on status, telehealth absolutely is going to play a, a, a role in that. And, uh, you know, we, we, the holy grail is trying to find the right balance of, of how to get efficiencies, uh, efficacies, and, and uh, a fair pricing on all of this. We'll have that same question on telehealth. It's not going to replace in-person care. It's going to supplement in-person care. 
it should make the system more efficient and effective. Uh, we got to make sure that those cost savings are passed to, to patients, but that the doctors are rightly and fairly compensated for their work as well. Hey, you know, I want to go to a, a, an audience question in a minute that we have for you, but I'm going to ask you another silly. I mean, I used to work in the United States Senate, and um, I worked for Senator Jeff Bingaman of New Mexico. He was a very smart guy, but he wasn't smart on everything. And so we would have kind of teach-ins. You know, you had to kind of tool up on, on various stuff. You know, I've been always interested in what the literacy level of members of Congress and, you know, senators are when it comes to the increasing complexity you know, of health questions. And I'm, you know, what's coming to mind today is a very smart guy is retiring. Francis Collins, director of the National Institutes of Health, is retiring today. You know, and, and Francis, Dr. Collins used to go up and spend a lot of time kind of tooling up, helping uh, members of Congress tool up on all these issues. You know, I, I'm just interested in how you do it. Not what the lit I don't, you know, what, not whether you would give somebody an A to a D or something in there, but, you know, the, 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 the process by which all of you up there continue to refresh, update, understand the complexity of these health issues that you're, you're being asked to weigh in on. No, that, that's a wonderful point you're making. Look, we all come from wherever we come. There's 435 districts. Each one is distinct. We bring distinct experiences, mm -hmm. everything from lawyers to doctors to people in business uh, to educators, etc. cetera. Uh, some of us come in with a, 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 a narrow but deep understanding of a few things. Some of us come in with a very broad but uh, uh, less deep understanding of a lot of things. But no one comes in understanding everything about everything. It's, uh, we need to learn that along the way. Uh, so it starts with making sure you surround yourself with a really good team. I have an amazing staff who uh, goes deep on these issues. Part of my job is representative. I have to listen to all the different voices in my district. Uh, I have a district which has a, a very high concentration of, of health care, of what I call the life sciences corridor. So I'm fortunate in that respect that I can talk to constituents, both individuals and, and some of the uh, corporate leaders in our, our community and get an understanding of the different aspects of it. Uh, but at, at the end of the day, these are big, complex issues that we have to spend the time studying and understanding to get our heads around but also know that even when we think we have an answer, we're going to dig deeper and find that no answer is complete or comprehensive and, and constantly be willing to adjust our perspective. Fascinating. I appreciate your candor on this. It's like one of the things, you know, you, you wonder how the sausage is being made. Look, we have a question for you uh, from Marguerite. Marguerite? Hello. My name is Marguerite Pridgen. I'm the Director of Federal Policy for the Corporation for Supportive Housing, or CFH. I have several questions for the panelists. What barriers exist to accessing telehealth services, especially with respect to availability and use of technology required to provide services? Is there data showing where COVID-19 telehealth funding has had the most impact? So, so I guess the question is twofold. One, data about COVID-19 telehealth uh, services and availability from your perspective. And, you know, what are the barriers, you know, which you've gotten into a little bit, but what are the barriers to telehealth expansion in these areas? So let me first touch on the on the data because I think that's important. The, the first line data, top line data, is that the use of telehealth has, has exploded during COVID. Not surprising to anyone, but uh, if you talk to a, a medical practice, to a hospital, and look at their numbers, what their projections for uh, telehealth visits in 2020 uh, were off by orders of magnitude. It wasn't that they doubled, but they went up 10 and 20 and 30 times uh, during the course of the pandemic out of necessity. And the same way, look, we're, I'm talking to you on Zoom. Uh, two years ago, I had never used Zoom before. This will be my fifth call of the day. And I'll, by the time I'm done, I'll probably have 10. I think everyone is experiencing that. Um, but if you dig deeper into the data, what's important to understand is how is it being used? Where is it being most effective? Um, how can we expand on that effectiveness? But also, where are there gaps and, and where are we missing? And that is the, the next level of study. So the data is there. I think the analysis is taking place uh, currently. Uh, but one thing that's very clear, there are some very obvious gaps. I touched on some of them, places where broadband just isn't acceptable or isn't available, rather. Um, if you don't have broadband, you don't have telehealth. And so we need to make sure that we're expanding that broadband. But it's also places where there's reluctance, resistance to uh, um, use use new technologies. Uh, some of the data shows that it's not just about, you know, the, the first assumption is that the older you are, the less comfortable you might be with technologies. Uh, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, but there are barriers to technology hesitancy, technology uh, fear of technology, and we've got to overcome that. And uh, then, then the next piece is, um, it's one thing to be able to have, I'm, I'm talking on an iPad here, uh, you, you got to have access to the, the devices. 
But right. I think as we move forward into the, the next generation of, of healthcare, uh, we're going to see that there are increasingly um, uh, more sophisticated, more advanced devices that will be a part of that telehealth package. But we may have to make sure everyone has access to those as well. Okay, so I'm going to sneak in a little one. You know, I interviewed a while back Senator Joe Manchin, and you know, he's much in the news of late. And at that time, it's before like you know, the big drama of the moment. And and I asked him about it's like during the election. I asked him about Medicare for all, and he said, Steve. Medicare for all, we can't afford Medicare for some. And so I guess my question is, among your colleagues, is there a sense of gravity in terms of, you know, the, the, the debt figures of looking at the added obligations, the government, these kinds of issues? Does that come up in the kind of caucus that you're in? Or is there, and I hate to use the word disregard, and I don't really mean it that strongly, is there a version that um, at this moment, given the needs and inflection point in America, given the divides on race and inequality, that we just have to use this as an inflection point and not worry, and, you know, kind of, you know, debt be damned. Where are you on that? So uh, I, I can give you a personal answer, but I also have the, the um, benefit. I'm a part of several different caucuses. So uh, from my personal standpoint, you know, one of the reasons I ran for Congress uh, 10 years ago, the first time, is we need to provide our kids a, a, a stable and secure future. And, and part of that is, is fiscal responsibility. Uh, that's why I'm a Blue Dog. I'm a part of the Blue Dog Caucus. I'm a part of the Problem Solvers Caucus, which is bipartisan, 29 Democrats, 29 Republicans. Uh, I'm in leadership of the, the New Democrat Coalition, uh, which are, are 95 of the, the pro-growth, uh, more moderate Democrats. Uh, I can promise you we talk about these issues day in and day out. We need to provide health care to all Americans. It should be a right, not a privilege for every single American. We need to bend the curve on the cost of health care. We're spending upwards of two or three times uh, per capita on health care what other developed countries are, are, are spending. And we're not necessarily getting better results. Some areas we're leading, but other areas we're trailing. So I think there's a lot we can do to look at how we deliver health care, how we develop the, the resources and, and capabilities to ensure that all of us have the, the quality of, of, of of living the, the, the life expectancy we, we all aspire to, and over that life expectancy have the best health and health care possible. Uh, but there's no question we have to do it in a, a fiscally sound and fiscally responsible way. Well, listen, we're going to end it there. But Representative Brad Schneider, thanks so much for your candor and sharing those thoughts with us today. And, you know, I'm glad you're, you're in there, you know, wrestling with these issues in real time. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. It's great being with you. It's a privilege to be working on these issues. These are the challenges we face as a country, and working together, I have no doubt we can tackle the challenge. Thank you.